Welcome back again. It's been a while since the last video again. Um, so you might wondering what I'm doing uh, currently, or maybe you're not wondering because you're not interested. But anyways, if you're wondering, so currently I'm pretty uh, busy in my uh, company business and uh, for uh, talking about uh, technical stuff I'm working on. It's mainly now Azure related stuff and conjunction with architectural stuff and software. So updating all the new stuff which is coming up in different areas. And now let's come to the today's talk. It's about uh, .NET Aspire. So this is a talk like it probably is something which starts a series. And what I want to do here is um, I first of all want to claim that Aspire from my first looks at it is now a pretty, pretty impressive um, collection of tools and uh, technology wise. It's very, very interesting. It's very well done from Microsoft, I think at least, but it has uh, certain limits. And I think people tend to misunderstand what Microsoft is showcasing there. And it kind of, kind of depends, of course, on the audience. Um, so who you are, what you're doing, what your level in businesses. So that's why I wanted to uh, have this first uh, session here where I try to explain how I see Azure and um, Aspire, sorry, and the scope of Aspire where I see its limits and try to uh, kind of summarize what I interpret uh, in Aspire. And then we will see, we will go on, I will see your commands hopefully, and uh, maybe I will also do live sessions, let's see. With all of that, I prepared a little presentation. Let me switch over to my screen here. Um, so I um, prepared a little presentation to explain certain stuff and I have no animations in it or other fancy stuff. So let me just go through it. It's just a few slides. So what is Aspire um, now? So first of all, as I see it, it's a bunch of stuff. So on the one on the blue side here on the screen, what I'm talking about is that, first of all, it is technically speaking a workload. I'll come to that in the demo later, a workload uh, that you install on your dev box. That is the starting point kind of. That's one of the parts it is. Then when you install this workload, what you get is uh, for the first moment, you get project templates. So .NET project templates, which is very interesting. I have to say that Aspire is not limited to .NET projects. But that's kind of the starting point. Okay, you have to have .NET uh, tooling installed on your box in order to use Aspire. Okay, cool. Uh, what you also can get, you don't have to, but you can get a bunch of extension code. So it's just source code that you see in certain projects in your project. And then you can tangle uh, around and, and no, not tangle, mangle around with it, sorry, and change it however you want. So kind of interesting. I will show all of that. And then what also is included is there's a new base type uh, or a new type. Actually, it's not a base type, probably. Probably, to be honest, I should have deleted base here because you're not inheriting from it. It's a new type, which is called distributed application, which kind of hints you where this is going to lead. So Aspire is in speaking in terms of who is it for? It is not for you if you're just writing a console application and you're doing stuff, or if you have a single web app, which is just a shop uh, web app, that's probably something where Aspire is a little bit too much to bring in. But if you have like a web application talking to an API, which talks to other APIs, which talks to a database, which talks to a cache, which talks to whatever, and then probably Aspire might be a good point for you. And from that on, from that point on, it gets useful more and more if you add more dependencies between, if you will, speaking in, in Visual Studio, if you have multiple projects speaking together. We will see that. And then there's this big green area where everybody is pretty hyped about, including Microsoft, which is a dashboard, which is a cool thing. And it's very, very important to have such a thing on your dev box because this is where devs usually get lost very quickly. Um, and this dashboard is pretty cool as long as you stick to Microsoft's plan and toolings and so, but it's a good plan if you ask me. So, but this is the thing you always see in presentation, the dashboardy thing, because naturally on the blue side here, there's not much to see to present. Okay. 
So, but this is all technical blah, blah. Okay. I recognize that. Okay. What does it mean? Uh, so let me, uh, in other words, uh, kind of. So there is, if you want to explain what Aspire is, there is, first of all, existing stuff. The majority, as I wrote here, of developers wasn't just aware of that this existed. Okay. So for several reasons, first of all, it's a bunch of NuGet packages. Then as a normal developer, as I consider myself, you don't have time to discover all of that. Um, the documentation is kind of spread out all over the place. Um, and you know, the project templates of Microsoft don't bring it in. So people don't see it whatsoever. So world is turning around and now two major parts are in the focus. If you ask me of Aspire, the first one is open telemetry, which is, um, um, a, uh, a standard which is used for logging, monitoring and tracing. Um, it's an industry standard. It's uh, pretty useful. You should use it, but it's hard to configure. It's hard to wrap your head around, especially when you have to do other stuff in your daily work. So that is why a lot of people weren't aware of it. And now people got aware of it because Microsoft tells you a lot about it and now how to configure it. Okay. So Aspire brings this kind of build in, which is nice. The other thing is service discovery, which means if you have different types of what I told you, different types of dependencies in your project, like my web UI is one project, but it needs the service API to be there. Um, the API and this API on, on the other hand needs a database and a cache and whatever and a storage account. If you have kind of those projects running around and it hasn't um, have to be a big project, a complicated one, what I just told you, like UI backend database, this is already enough so that you have the wish to say, Hey, can I kind of simplify the process that my UI knows where the endpoints of my API are, can check if it's there can react if it's not there. So health endpoints, stuff like that. And then um, that when I deploy it to different stages, they don't have to mess around with URIs and stuff like that on in my source code or in my app settings, if you will. So is there something? This is service discovery and it is new, both of them. Open telemetry is not new and service discovery is not that new. Those are NuGet packages you could use before uh, Aspire. You have uh, to ask yourself the question, did I use it? Why not? Was I aware of it? Stuff like that. The second thing is there are cool types and extensions. Again, base is a little bit wrong here, um, but types and extensions that Microsoft brings with Aspire with makes your life easier and give you a starting point. So the types actually are essential which is uh, around the type distributed application again, which is uh, very, very important in the terms of Aspire. It's very well done and implemented. I like it a lot. We will look at this, but you know, that's what it is. And then uh, you have some extension methods. As I said, well, this is just Microsoft showing you how to use the stuff they bring in. Okay. That is what Aspire is doing. It. And then the third thing, and this is because Microsoft is Microsoft and can do stuff, which you as a developer for little libraries certainly could do, but it's a lot of effort. It's deep tool integration. So if you have .NET workload, this is something, if you want to create a project template in .NET, it's already a life cycle that you have to maintain, but a complete workload, well, that's another thing. Okay. So a complete workload, extends your .NET CLI by a whole bunch of new things, including project templates, but commands and whatever, name it. So this is what they made and they integrated it in their tools, like for instance, Visual Studio, so <clears throat> that you have right click experiences on certain points and so on, which again, is not a good idea if you ask me, but you know, they did it. And then because this is a Microsoft initiative and I'm talking about that in a second, they even uh, kind of integrated or worked together, obviously, with other teams like with the AZD team. So what is AZD? We will see that uh, later when it comes to the demo. 
but this is what Microsoft can do. And now it seems like this is a whole new shift in technology or whatever, and it isn't. It's not. It's not a pretty good integration and developer experience. So, let, let's summarize this. Is this useless? Useless? No, 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 no. It's really well done and you should consider using it. But if you ask me, not the way Microsoft devs show it in demos. That is why, because it's naive what they show you. At least the current demos I saw, like the build, which was two weeks ago, I think, or one week, I don't remember, I'm getting old. The build showed a lot of stuff and so on. It's, it's you know, always the happy path. They have new eShop uh, sample out there, kind of the AdventureWorks 2024, if you know what that is. And if you're even older than, uh, or not so old like AdventureWorks, uh, so then it's Contoso. And if you know Contoso, then you know this is a demo case Microsoft does. So they are showing this up and down all the way. Nice. All of that is assuming that, first of all, um, this needs to be OP team, ops team, not OR team. Uh, that Oh, no. Uh, wait a second. I'm talking shit. So, first of all, they assume that you are working alone, if you ask me, or in an already aligned team. Aligned means everybody, you and your co-workers, are totally aligned that, you know, using open telemetry, using service discovery in a way, in a certain way, how to measure telemetry, all of that is kind of, yeah, let's do it this way. Because if you come along now and you are a fan of uh, Aspire and you just want to bring it in and you're not aligned with your team, which is honestly the default situation in most uh, companies I know of, then probably you will raise questions and people will not be happy just like that. The next thing is Microsoft showcases deployments in Azure, direct deployments. So this is one of the cool things Aspire brings you, like the happy path, one click, one command, whatever experience to use AZD, which is another tool to just simply say, well, this is now running on my machine. Let's just spin up one command and one command only, and then it runs in Azure just, just like that. So this is stupid, if you ask me, for several reasons. Microsoft says this is an experience for you as a developer. So you're hacking around, okay. So you're hacking around, and now you want to run exactly what you have in the proposed architecture in Azure to debug if it's running in Azure correctly. So proposed architecture means, hey, we are container based like we should be nowadays. We are using Azure container app environments, uh, Azure container apps deployed to that environments, blah, blah, blah. We're doing all of that. In order to do that, they use BICEP, which is natural because it's their infrastructure as code language. In the default scenario, this BICEP is crap. Okay, if you do that, you will get a real annoyed and even angry operations department in your company. I'm not saying that you get problems if you're working for a little startup, you and your body are making millions of dollars in two weeks, and then you say, so whatever, I have an Azure subscription for whatever reason, and now I fire up in my dev test subscription, whatever I have just to check. So it's one command, I do that. In a normal corporate environment, this isn't even possible because you will not have a landing subscription where you can simply deploy with AZD and BICEP. So this is why the second reason why it's naive. The third reason is it's directly contradicting a lot of stuff they have, for instance, in my beloved Cloud Adoption Framework. So Cloud Adoption Framework speaks about naming conventions, speaks about automation infrastructures, code deployment from your CD pipeline, stuff like that. And it directly tells you, you should not do it like imperatively, like from your shell or whatever. You should not run around and be able to do it. So being privileged in your normal command line session to deploy something to Azure, this is not a good situation especially considering that Microsoft currently has big security issues in now it's June 2024 and we are running around with a lot of zero day exploits and stuff like that. So it's not a good idea to find shortcuts for developers to just approach to Azure to, to run it. So that's naive. So it's working. 
Um, nevertheless, it is still cool and useful because what they built in, which is still preview, is a way to tackle people like me and say, yeah, 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 you don't have to take the automation we provide. You can do different stuff, which is cool, but it's still better. So currently everybody jumps on Inspire, not everybody, but a lot of people jumping on Inspire and saying, this is so cool, you should do it, blah, and so on. So I'm doing this series, or let's say the starting point at least, in order to tell my subscribers and visitors, hey, it's cool, keep an eye on it, be aware that it's a very early stage. It just went GA this year. Um, be aware that this is a very early stage. You need to do some proof of concept with that and so on. Okay, that is the end of my presentation. And now we come to the point where we want to play with that a little bit. Okay, so we are already a little bit into the recording. Now um, let's just find a starting point to say, hey, what is it actually? How does it look? So on my machine here, uh, currently I don't have um, the Aspire workload installed. So you can go .NET, and by the way, you need .NET 8 um, to work with that at least. Uh, workload list, and as you can see, here is no workload installed. If you don't know what a workload is, it's like I said, it's a, not only a new CLI tool like .NET EF, like this one here, .NET tool list dash G. This is now I have the .NET EF tool installed so that I can do .NET EF commands. That's not what a workload is. A workload is bigger. It is like a collection of tools, project templates, and so on. It's, it's completely adding stuff to the .NET ecosystem on your machine. So what you do is uh, workload install Aspire and be aware that you need to be an admin uh, on Windows. By the way, if you didn't know, what I heard is that one of the upcoming Windows 11 releases will have this command or this prefix. And I'm very, very excited. I haven't seen it yet, but sudo will come to Windows. I heard of it. That would be nice because I don't have to open my shell as an admin. So let's install the Aspire workload. So as you can see, um, there are different uh, things going on like an Aspire hosting SDK, project templates, orchestration, hosting, um, MSI, so some installer and a dashboard, which I uh, told you about. We will see that in a second. It's nice. That's it. So. Let's open now a normal privilege terminal and let's uh, go to my coding uh, uh, thingy. So, and let's do uh, a .NET, um, what is it, a uh, new list. So, .NET new, now, after you installed the workload, has those new templates. And I'm not talking about all the details today, but it has, for instance, new project templates where you can use Aspire app host only. What is it? I don't know. Aspire application, Aspire service default, Aspire starter application, and an X unit Aspire test. So what we gonna do, I will try this out, Aspire starter now. So let's do that, .NET new, Aspire starter. Let's call it Aspire demo 01 in Aspire demo 01 output. By the way, Speaking of that, I think here Microsoft uh, kind of needs to adjust a little bit because by convention, if you do the name dash n, it should, you should expect it to create an output folder like that. It does not. It will do it in the folder where you are. So that's why I'm adding the dash o for outputting it to Aspire Demo 01. Okay, let's do it. So he's doing it. So. Uh, let's uh, go into that folder. So that's what you get. So basically what you have, I'm not, I'm on purpose not opening it in Visual Studio. So now you have a web project, which is kind of the UI. You have an API service, which is kind of your REST API. And then you have two things which come from Aspire, which is first of all, the app host, which is very crucial. And I explain you what this is in a second. And you have something called service defaults, which uh, I'm going to talk about, um, or I'm going to talk about too. So, uh, but what you can do is 
you can right away say .NET run dash dash project and you go to the, the app host here, this folder, and run this CS project. You're not running anything else. You're not running the web. You're not running the API service whatsoever. So what you get now is after some thinking, hopefully, let me drink a coffee. <laughs> By the way, my machine is slow. I reinstalled it. I don't know why it's slow. Um, I have to do it again, whatever. So normally what should happen now, and it's not running on my machine, I don't know why. If you .NET run this project, it should bring up a browser in the correct location. And it's not doing it on my machine. It's not doing it on my Mac. I tried it out on the Mac too, it's working. But it brings you this URL. So what this is basically is if you have um, several projects running locally, this is uh, what gives you the dashboard. And I'm opening it now because everybody does it. So just to show you, it's, it's not hard to achieve. So let's go over here and look at this uh, thingy. So this is the dashboard you see all over the place. So it is something which now is included in your project. All the developers have now nice click experience in all the things which are so important, like for instance, to see the logs of your API servers. So remember that you used to see that in a command window which span up and then you have multiple command windows when you start multiple projects. All of this is now no longer needed. You can just simply here using a front, um, this front end, this UI, to look into your um, outputs, your console output. You can see that structured logging is in place. So at least there is something. You can uh, see here that uh, there is uh, information uh, spun out. You can see traces. Currently, there are no traces, which is like open telemetry. Here it is, open telemetry. And you can see metrics, which again also are already running. And you can see a graph. It's very nicely done. It is exception count, all the stuff you might need uh, to know about whatever. So. Uh, when I go back to my dashboard, I can also now have a simple, simple thing to uh, click experience to open my front end here. There you go. This is their example. As always, it's a counter example, whatever. And I don't even know if my traces show something. So here's my traces. Here's the web front end, 93 milliseconds. Nice. I see some metrics going up. Um, so here it is. And now traces are mostly interesting if you are hitting um, endpoints. So let's see if this is visible. So what you can see here now is that there is a weather trace, which says uh, something from the web front end performed a get operation on the slash weather, which is just my uh, URL here. And then this is kind of, aha, uh -huh, this is interesting because this was now something which got traced through my application. So two things were, lo um, were logging information out, but those logs are now kind of associated to each other because tracing means that your logging system, in this case, open telemetry, understands that this request to the web front and the get request, which overall the whole operation took like uh, 600 milliseconds, but it was uh, it contained two operations like a get on the web server for the UI and a get on the API backend. And now you can see a lot of details here. So this is what structured logging gives you. Um, for instance, traces uh, give you. And this is very, very good. <coughs> so I like it. That's very well done again. I'm not uh, here to say this is bad or something. And the most I like the most here, uh, what I like the most is that you have got rid finally of the selecting multiple startup projects, in that case, the API and the front end, and then you have those different log outputs and stuff like that. All of that is gone, which is very nice. Okay, with that, let's go to the SLN and let's finally look into Visual Studio. And again, today is not about showing you all the details, all of which I'm showing you is already part of some videos uh, and things I will link in the description here. 
and is very well documented. This is a happy path experience. Uh, but again, I, I will show you what it is. So uh, what you have is you just have a pretty normal looking web app. It's an, a Blazor web app and you have a, a API, which is here minimal API. Let's look at this first because here we'll start. This is the kind of the basic sample of Microsoft we all know, know which is now, now our weather API. And here is a minimal API to expose an um, map uh, a get endpoint for weather forecast and then it does something which is really bad style if you ask me because we have no logic and no separation but for the sake of the demo it is what it is so we have some random values here in a record and that's what it is and it's a uh, built by a web application builder but interestingly enough this thing is now inside of it it is now adding service defaults which is coming from this extensions and which this is. This is the call it, it uses. And um, it is doing things in a certain order to add open telemetry, health checks, service discovery, cli HTTP client defaults to add service discovery to them. So every HTTP client you use in your application, in your front end to uh, go over to your back end is now included in service in, uh, discovery re uh, re um, resilience resilience i always struggle i'm german you know resilience handler is now included there's a default or a standard resilience handler from uh, microsoft now which you can use so that's what i talked about you know nothing really new this was there and this is again there uh, in a certain package. I will show you that this already exists. This already exists as NuGet package. This was possible before um, adding uh, re resiliency and service discovery. Nothing of this is really new. Again, open telemetry. This is how you configure it. And now we have uh, exporters in open telemetry, which are here configured in a pretty weird way, if you ask me, because here it's using a bool to check if this is configured. Here it's not using the bool, but directly going to string is now no empty. All of that is considerably open to optimization, which is cool. I just, you know what I think? When I do a pull request in my company and I am presented with something like this, inconsistencies, Probably it's not going through. Okay, so somebody's saying, are you kidding me? You're doing it here in that way and here in the same method in another way. Shouldn't we do it in the same way? And by the way, shouldn't should we call this twice here? So let's uncheck that. So if you uncheck it, he's telling you, but this is here. Um, this is set. If you want to use Azure uh, Application Insights as your open telemetry sync, where you're locked to, you need to add a NuGet package. Let's do that quickly, just for the sake, not being on the happy path all the time. Manage NuGet packages in that project. And now going to look for this NuGet package and add it to the project. Hmm, I have to do it here. So just add it to the service defaults project and now do that, accept it. And now what you get is uh, here, this is now using and now this is configured. But now my, my question is why, why? So what you can do is, um, by the way, if um, OLTB exporter is set, so what you can do is um, uh, var uh, open, mm, can we do that? Hotel export endpoint. So let's do that. Let's optimize this a little bit. Uh, so let's see var uh, use uh, app insights, whatever, because this is now this string. Um, okay, so now we have two bools, and what we can do is not use OLTP and not use app insights. You will see um, return. That's it. We don't do anything. Return the builder. Okay, nice. And if we have something, we can do var uh, open tell builder equals this one. Let's just do it. 
and now open tell builder open to use this and open tell you use this and this is now if use app insights so get rid of this so i'm just saying that this could be also a solution to do that now they still could uh, comment that out whatever um and i would do it something like that um but anyways this is not saying oh no it's so bad because they did it i am still learning by the way so i am not sure what this means in conjunction with that i'm not sure because it looks like it's injecting a pretty naive health check again and then using this as the alive check I need to figure out what the purpose of that is. They have some uh, comments on that, but you know, interesting to look into the pattern. What's more interesting, because I told you in the demo that basically this is just using stuff which already existed, is if you look here, you see what I meant. So a lot of stuff is coming in, uh, which is already available for you in your default projects without any Aspire or whatever. So you could do it without Aspire in your projects. What the service defaults is, how it's usable, I will explain it in later videos. So uh, keep on here. So interestingly enough, if you look into the API service, you see now that it has a project reference to the service defaults. The same should be true for the web. So that is the trick. So remember, maybe some of you remember that there was this project type which is a shared project. Um, so that was something they said, well, actually you can do, it's not a reference to project. This was like, hey, you have source code, which is there. And then if you drag it in, you can compile it with your settings, blah, blah. Kind of the same idea here. They just say, you know what? We're doing it with a project, which has just one extension method. And if you reference the project, it's now like a DLL. Uh, and it is a DLL, and the the point here is it is a it has a certain flag so that the compiler understands it. This is also new, the tooling, as I said, and there are different flags. This is not the only one. So now it knows that this is the shared project for um, the Aspire. So this is also coming with Aspire new uh, flags for the build system. And now it knows, oh, this is what it is. And usually you have the extension method, you add stuff here. We will talk about this later, but this is just putting out the configuration stuff of your program file into another file, which is only there once in your whole project, no matter how many APIs and web services you have. So the web app itself is also it's it's just configured in the same way it's using the service defaults as we said and then something interesting here happens this is what service discovery is when you use it so what you have you have an http client which should talk to the weather api which is that one and the client base address now is not something you get out specifically from the app settings or so you're just saying in that weird syntax it is HTTPS first, if not available, then fall back to HTTP. So that is what that means. And there is something which is called API service for some reason. Uh, please use the service discovery, which is now built in a NuGet package, to give me the current address for that thing for API service. Kind of works like services in Kubernetes. Uh, if you are aware of that, so you're not saying, where's my address, you're just leaving that to the backplane saying hey kubernetes give me give me the api service for me where is it so the same idea here and there are other there are frameworks like dapper you might be aware of which can be configured into aspire already uh, to reuse existing service discovery technologies like dapper not to start over again which is also nice and um, that is interesting as well so that brings us to the last point, which is the app host project, which should from now on, if you use Aspire, be the one project you use to start. So you should never using Aspire go to this configure startup projects again, because now this is done by Aspire. It knows what to run, what to debug, what to configure, because you, you told him here. So what this means now is I need project references 
into all projects I want to manage. So that's what, if I look here, you can see it has project references to the web and the API servers, not to the service defaults, because this is referenced by those projects. Okay, so you don't care in Aspire itself. And then you have this one magic package, which is the app host package of Aspire. And this package brings you the one central thing, which as a .NET developer is really important for you to understand and to learn, that is the distributed application type. And this type is like um, um, an abstraction, if you will, or a helper for you to say, I know you have different types of things. You have an API, you have 10 APIs, whatever, in different projects in this solution. Then you have, I don't know what you have. You have web apps, you have uh, Blazor, React, whatever you have. And we will look into that or maybe console applications, containers, running services, whatever it is, you can configure all of that using the fluid configuration type of uh, thing here, like, hey, uh, the API service is coming out of this project, and from now on, I will name it API service, exactly this. So wherever you now reference endpoints, for instance, of that API, you need to use this string and this string only. It is string based. That is why when we go back to the startup of my program, uh, of my UI, this string must be exactly the same, casing everything like the one you configured in your app host. That's it, just the string. Probably, again, bed style, probably you should have something like an overall project defining constants for that so that you're not um, prone to typos and stuff like that, but you know, details. And then when you have this service defined and said, you see, he's storing that as an iResource builder um, here. And now you can say, well, I have another project, which is a UI, I'll call it this. And this later should expose endpoints to the public. That is what, as far as I don't uh, understand, is what this method tells us. So later, later means not development, later in production. This needs to expose to be accessible by the public internet. Uh, mark that this is not done here. So the API is not exposed to the public internet. And then what you do here with the last thing is, oh, by the way, this thing, so this thing, needs to have access to the endpoints of this thing. Here it is, of this thing. That's it. That's it in terms of now it knows, oh, I need to inject all the service discovery stuff into my uh, web frontend. And I don't need a variable for that because I will not use that as a reference to other projects. And then that's it. You run it. And as long as you are on that happy path, there is some other stuff to see. They have app settings here in the development, nothing surprising, it's just logging. They have some properties which are different um, because depending on what you do, you have HTTPS, HTTP, and it's different. You see, it's, it's doing stuff like the open telemetry endpoint configuration, uh, it's doing .NET environment, now they finally did it because they had this in place only and then they always forgot this because this is also important but anyways and then they have the dashboard endpoint url and so on pre-configured and you will see different files there is more to learn here because there are things like manifest files for uh, aspire uh, aspire manifest file which are pr um, pretty interesting if you deal with let's say node.js based stuff so things out of the tool chain of .NET and you can do different stuff there. It's uh, pretty interesting um, to see. And if I F5 from Visual Studio to do the final step here, um, it should work ex as expected. Let's see if it's opening the browser here. I'm not even sure. Um, and no, uh, he says failed uh, because ASP net core URLs environment variable was not set in exception 
failed to configure dashboard resource because ASP.NET Core URLs environment was not set. That's interesting. Did I mess it up, uh, by the way? ASP.NET Core environment, this is set on HTTPS. So can I still run it from here? So interesting. Um, we already have a problem. Can I run it here? If I run the app host project, is it still running or did I mess it up? So that would be another interesting session. Let's try that out. <clears throat> it looks like it works. Strange. So debugging, uh, I, I missed something here, but you, you can see it's uh, still having issues here and there. Uh, by the way, to finish that up, you can also pretty easily, because of this structure here, as you can see, so this is where Aspire comes in. And this is optional. You don't need to do that in your projects. But to add Aspire to an existing project, all you need to do, in quotes, all you need to do is add this app host thingy, which is a project template in Farm New Project, Aspire app host. And then you need to add references to it, and then you need to start it. That's basically what you do. You don't touch your projects in principle. You don't have to. This is a really cool idea. So let me sum up here. What does all that mean? Again, Aspire is pretty interesting and it will evolve and we need to watch it. I will do it and I will keep you informed whenever I learn something, but be patient because uh, the same is true for me than it is for you. I have work to do in order to afford <laughs> to do stuff like that. Uh, so it will take time. We as a team are currently pretty curious because we like the F5 experience, which is not working in Visual Studio currently. But anyways, it's uh, just something misconfigured. But we want to have that. The onboarding of new people will be dramatically better, I swear to God, because you don't have to explain them, hey, you have to start this and that and then whatever. You need to onboard them a little bit, of course, to add user secrets to certain stuff, of course. But the overall understanding of an um, of a, of a line of business application is drastically improved when we have, when we find a way to have this in place. What I really don't like about the whole thing is that Microsoft is not getting tired of showing this AZD stuff, which I didn't show you for a reason, because I want to be very careful about that. This Azure upspinning stuff, using AZD, first of all, AZD in the first place is bad. If you ask me, it's my opinion, this is a really bad thing. It is really stupid and naive to rely on that. There are some audiences which will like it. Like I said, private people using Azure or startups using Azure. Problem with this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is exactly the audience which is not using Azure. They are using AWS most of the time. So is it a marketing thingy from Microsoft to drag people in from other cloud platforms? I'm guessing so. But they are directly contradicting their core market, which is enterprise um, Azure customers you know, which are struggling very hard to implement the secure score recommendations and the Azure portal recommendations to do things in a certain way, to put stuff in virtual networks, in private networks and so on. So this side of Microsoft is yelling it at, at us, doing it CAF conform in a professional way. And this side of Microsoft at the same time is kind of laughing at us saying, what are you doing? Just ACD up this thing and you're done, basically. And this is true for Microsoft since the last 30 years I am aware of, because I'm in that business far too long, probably, but they don't stop it and they again fall into this trap. I very, very don't like it. And that is what I want to concentrate on on my future posts. So if you're interested, please give me some comments. You don't have to describe, uh, subscribe, I mean, um, I, not I don't care, I love subscribers, but you know, the comments are far more interesting for me than subscriptions, do it. Tell me what you want to see, what I need to concentrate on, uh, and we will see how this proceeds. Thanks for watching and see you next time.